Hello, BK with uh, BK and Lone Standing <coughs> uh, here for another vlog entry on November 8th, uh, 2021. And um, I just wanted to talk about some things that were on my mind. Um, and it was boiling in me, so I thought I'd go ahead and shoot the vlog and uh, maybe edit it later. But, uh, man, thank you for uh, tuning in. Thank you for those who have been following and watching the, the uh, vlog series. And uh, please subscribe to the channel. That's one easy way you can help us out by subscribing. We have to get to a thousand uh, subscribers before we're even allowed to monetize the channel, which is very unfortunate because we really could use the money. <laughs> and um, please check out our Bandcamp page where you can purchase our music and support us. And so we have the BK and the Understanding Bandcamp page. Then I also have, um, if you're a person of faith, or if you just want to support uh, us more. I have uh, some solo projects where I publish my actual first works, uh, which were worship songs I wrote when I used to lead music at a, at a church. And I publish those under the Beacon Kid moniker. And so uh, I'll put a link to both Bandcamp uh, pages today. Man, if you could buy our music from, from us on Beacon Understanding's Bandcamp page, that helps us out so much more than... Uh, just streaming. I saw someone post uh, a, st uh, a little fact sheet recently on uh, Instagram that claimed, this off the top of my head, but it claimed like it takes 5,000 streams to equal the purchase of one album maybe. It, my numbers may be off, but just off the top of my head, let, you know, that's still a lot. Uh, and when you're an uh, up-and-coming band like we are, um, li very little known, sadly at the time, uh, you know, where it, it takes, it it may be years before we get to that point unless we start getting more attention. Hence why I'm starting to emphasize our YouTube channel. We're hoping that YouTube will st help us reach our fan base. We know you're out there. We know people that our music resonates with are out there. That's who we're looking for. Um, and so on that, uh, I want to get to today's topic. So to, I actually already shot this entry earlier, but I combined two or three topics that I think I'm going to have to split up because the video went 30 minutes long. And instead of chopping that up, I think I'm just going to reshoot. So in this particular vlog entry, I want to focus on um, inspirations on our current catalog. I had recently received an unwarranted criticism in return for accidentally uh, speaking my uh, feedback, that form of criticism. Um, and hurt, unintentionally hurt some people's uh, feelings who I care about and alienated them because of my opinion. And uh, But one of them it, who I wasn't even talking about uh, went on the attack and uh, said that my music was bad. So it got me to thinking about that particular topic. So um, real quickly, you know, there's three, four, three types of criticism uh, that I want to point out. And so the criticisms that I love and to consume and, and participate in are academic level criticisms where you analyze, you break something down, you analyze it, you look at the meaning behind it, you look at the beauty and the, the flaws of it maybe. And it will include the lower forms of criticism, um, which I'll mention in a second. But that is one that really is an, it's, a, it's beneficial as an intellectual exercise and it's enjoyable because usually it's focused on some type of art. And me being a liberal arts major, you know, I have a, an undergrad degree in liberal arts, and I used to teach high school English, and being very philosophically minded, um, uh, I love uh, literary criticisms. I love them. Man, they're, they're great. Especially, when, you know, when it's uh, over art I do love. But I, obviously I gravitate, gravitate towards, if I already like the book, I'm going to gravitate towards ones that are appreciating that work. So uh, I love consuming literary criticism. I love, you know, consuming uh, music criticisms and seeing other people break down some of my favorite albums and stuff. But I usually am drawn to the ones that appreciate it. And so those are good kind of criticisms. Um, now criticism, as I said, that literary, the academic criticisms, they will include the lower two forms of criticism. And so right below academic or, you know, academic criticisms would be like the form of criticism that's also called feedback. And that's where 
let's say I'm a, I'm a musician, I perform, and I need people around me who love me and, and uh, I can trust who will be honest with me and let me know of my shortcomings as well as genuine praise if I've done something well. And that would be feedback. It's still a form of criticism. But you need people like that in your life. And so that's still a good form of criticism. And now in ac academia, like below college level at least, this is a pet peeve of mine. But when I taught uh, high school English, there was this term that had started cropping up that it's an, it's an oxymoron. That's why I hate it. But it was called constructive criticism, which... That term is an oxymoron, doesn't make sense. They should just call it feedback. That's what they should call it. But instead, they come up with constructive criticism. Well, criticism is deconstructive. That's why it's an oxymoron. Because you're analyzing, you're breaking things down, you're looking at them and observing them and making discernments and things. Excuse me, sorry, I just ate lunch. You know, making discernments, and uh, so that... It's an oxymoron. I hate that term. But what they really mean is feedback, and uh, particularly feedback that's beneficial. So that's a type of criticism. Then the lowest form of criticism is just simply insulting. Or, you know, the category that you know from childhood, I like. I, I don't like that. Or that's good. Or that's bad. And there's nothing beyond that. It's just very superficial and meaningless in the end. It's always good to hear people who, who like something you've done. That, that's always, it's encouraging to hear that. But how, other than making you feel good, it's not real beneficial. But anyway, that being said, I would received, uh, someone told me that our, my music was bad. BK Understanding's music is bad. So I started thinking about that and that mentality and, you know, analyzing myself and, and trying to see the perspective when that's all they, were, they said. They didn't give me any reasoning or specifics behind it, just that it was bad. Yeah, but it got me thinking about those things, and so, um, and that same person called me a coward, and so I'm going to mention these two think topics real quick, and, and the emphasis is really to focus on inspirations, on why I, being the head of Beacon Understanding, have chosen to release our current catalog as of November 8, 2021. So everything we've released to this point is do-it-yourself music. We don't have a record label. We are not even signed to... An indie label, we have no support like that. We don't have any contracts with anyone like that. We are independent, literally, okay? We are self-funded. Um, we do have support from loved ones, especially me. Um, but we don't have like a record label. We don't have companies or anything behind us. We don't have access to professional studios, or we didn't. We didn't. When, um, going forward, hopefully, we'll, we, that's our plan is to use them. But... Everything to this point, November 8, 2021, is do-it-yourself, lo-fi music. So I was a former high school English teacher. Before that, you know, when I went back, you know, before I graduated college and was certified to teach, I spent years installing air conditioners and helping repair air conditioners and heating uh, systems. So I was an HVAC installer and helper, you know, whatever. I did that stuff. So... I don't have any background with recording. I don't have any, and I'm a self-taught musician. I didn't. I wasn't allowed to be in music in school because I had a parent who thought that only nerds were in band. And she, you know, well, I just gave it away. She has changed her mind since then. But when I was a kid, she was young enough and naive enough to think that I would be a loser if I was in band. She doesn't believe that anymore. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I wasn't allowed to become musically educated for those reasons, and. Um, so I'm self-taught, I mean, by every uh, meaning of the word, and most, the brunt of the work of our releases to this point, I've, I mean, I, I'm going to just throw this out there, but I've done like somewhere between 85 to 90% of the work on most of it. Like if we take all of it that's out, again, on November 8, 2021, like, and I'm the one that's least qualified, okay? So I just figure stuff out. So that means that our stuff is low quality it is lo-fi music even though we didn't use what some of my inspirations used to record it so it's not quite it doesn't have like static in there or pop from uh like being recorded on an analog system because i do have access to uh macbook pros and macbooks and a, a mac desktop 
and uh, I use GarageBand, I've used Logic, I've even used Audacity and open source software. And professional bands use those things, but I don't even have an EQ board. Okay, so I'm just figuring this stuff out and making the best of what I have access to. Especially since I don't have help. Okay. Now, I did have help uh, getting started. I did, and I've mentioned that multiple times, and I'm going to continue to mention it because I want to give that person credit. So, you know, uh, I had someone help record the drums for all the tracks that feature drums. Maybe, t I think there were two on Basil Keystones where Tim himself recorded those, his own drums, and mixed those. But aside from those two tracks, so far, we had help with all the other drum tracks. And then there were, there's the instrumental makeshift version that I released as a single. That song was completely mixed and mastered by someone else. So that is the only song where I didn't have to do everything myself. I just played the instruments. And then my drummer played the drums. So he played drums and I did everything else. And so that one I did have help with. And that's, why I'm, that's one of the ones I'm most proud of because the quality I think is really cool. And we just used Audacity for that. That's all. You know, an open source program. Because the person that helped didn't even have GarageBand or Logic Pro yet at the time. So then, you know, he, I did have help. And there are a couple other songs that were almost finished with that person. But then for two, over two years, I was left alone to finish these albums. So for two years, I essentially did things on my own. Then when it got to the mastering process, my drummer helped with that. He helped. Uh, now, I was confused on what mastering was because I'm not educated. So I sent him uh, the original files. So he actually ended up remixing some of the stuff for me. And, you know, getting some experience doing that and trying to improve my mixes. And some of them I wanted him to do that. Some of them just accidentally did because of the confusion I had. But then he mastered all the tracks. And then with Basil Keystones, there were, he did the same thing. But then there were a couple I went back because I just never was satisfied with them. And then I did a little bit more editing. And that's nothing against him. I think it has more to do with the poor quality of the recordings himself. Because again, I recorded most of the instruments myself, not having any experience. So it caused a lot of issues with the albums. But that being said, you know, like the brunt of the work I did myself, and I'm uneducated concerning music, um, both music itself and recording, and I have no experience. So. What made me brave enough to go ahead and put that out there, knowing it's flawed, knowing it's lo-fi, knowing it's poor quality, knowing a lot of people aren't going to be able to look beyond those limitations, what made me brave enough to do it were some of my inspirations. And so I want to mention some. Um, anyway, so, so one of my favorite bands, Someone Still Loves You, Boris Yeltsin. This is their, this is their debut album, okay? It's called Broom. Here's the back of it. This is one of my favorite albums of all time. I absolutely love this album. It's an album I go back to all the time to listen to. It has one of my favorite songs ever, I Am Warm and Powerful, track two. That's one of my favorite songs ever, uh, written by John Robert Cardwell. I've had the pleasure to meet at their shows. And I've also met the main lead singer, the one who leads the band now, Phil Dickey, who also has a side project uh, called Dragon N3 that's been really successful since they've kind of gone on, uh, on a hiatus. But th this is a huge inspiration for me to go ahead and release my flawed recordings and look at them as still pieces of art that were good enough, in my opinion, to share with the world. Okay, that's my opinion. And I know there are people out there who can appreciate them, despite all the flaws. So this album, just to make the connection, was recorded by the band themselves before they had a record label. And to my knowledge, off the top of my head, they recorded this in the attic of one of their family's homes. It was the attic space that was converted into a recording space. And then they went back to that space later for some of their later albums, like High Country, that's another good one, and this one. Uh, this was a collection of unreleased songs or demos and b-sides and outtakes. This is another favorite album of mine. It's called Tape Club. Someone Still Loves You, Boris Yeltsin, Tape Club. And I actually performed the intro track, The Clod and the Pebble, at uh, Miss Naylor's wedding, along with the song that I wrote for her. That is a music video now. 
because I thought it was a beautiful little song and I covered it for. But huge inspiration. They they made that album. Now it was a whole band. It wasn't just one person. Um, so the quality is better than what we've put out probably. And the album's been more successful. Like I don't have support. I'm gonna be honest. Like not like a group of support. Um, that being said, I don't have a lot of support. Even my own family, like, uh, they, I mean, I think they try in their own ways to support me and, and be there for me, but, you know, like, what? They, they don't know what, how else to help me other than they themselves buying the albums or maybe showing up to stuff, you know? Um, then another huge influence is uh, Daniel Johnston. This is not his uh, most famous album, but it's the one I saw over there on, with my records that I had. I, I, I'm pretty sure I picked this up when I saw him live, gosh, almost a decade ago um, in Dallas. I don't even remember that it was like a church that had been converted to a venue. I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head. But this guy is a huge influence on and gave me the, the courage to release my flawed recordings, okay, my imperfect albums okay Daniel Johnston this guy he's most famous for the hi how are you uh, work which Kurt Cobain wore a t-shirt uh, with that album art on it um, and got a lot of uh, photographs with it and it became it helped Daniel Johnston rise in popularity and then in Austin Texas they have the famous uh, mural of the album art on the side of a now uh, what uh, Asian food restaurant. I'm trying to remember if it's. I think it's Thai food. Yeah, because it's the restaurant's called Thai. How are you? How's it? You know. So that's famous in Austin. So Daniel Johnson was a huge impact and uh, influence. He literally recorded his music uh, on cassette recorders, like little back in the 80s, in his parents' basement. He would just play live. He'd hit record and play live and record it. Then when he heard the click of the cassette tape stop, he would. Fl take it out, flip it over, and continue exactly where he left off on the other side of the cassette tape. Pretty phenomenal. Um, and But it has very low, it has a lot of you know noise in the recordings. It's I mean, imagine recording albums on cassette tapes, like with just a cheap cassette recorder. Or maybe even like a, a you know, at the time, a, I don't know, a karaoke machine or something. So like, the quality was pretty lo-fi. And so we're, our music that's out, uh, right now, it's it's kind of today's version of that. Like again, I don't have any experience. And then a third inspiration that gave me that has really inspired me lately. That's newer to me. That's become a favorite band of mine. But they've been around uh, my whole life, and I just I didn't know who they were. Is Guided by Voices. And so that's the last one I'm going to mention. Sorry, back. So <laughs> that cut off uh, whenever I was talking about. Guided by Voices and how Robert Pollard was a former school teacher and they just started making their first works uh, in their in his, I believe his home, possibly basement. They're from the Ohio area. I can't remember if basements are common in that area or not. I've never actually been to Ohio. Hopefully that'll change. Uh, hopefully Beacon Understanding will grow in popularity and we can go tour the United States. I mean, I'd love to make a living uh, just, uh, sharing my art with you. But anyway, uh, after that, I had to go. Uh, I decided to back up files and uh, delete them off of the card I was using. Um, and I thought of, in, in between that time, I thought of some other uh, lo fi, independent, do it yourself type albums. Um, so I mentioned Someone Still Loves You, Boris Yeltsin's uh, Broom. And so it's called Broom. Check it out. I mentioned their tape club, and I showed that image earlier. Um, I mentioned Daniel Johnston earlier. Uh, this is Yip Jump music combined with, uh, oh, what is the other one? Summer 1983. Uh, so I have that on vinyl. I could have swore I had Hi, How Are You, but I may have been mis may be mistaken. I also forgot that I had uh, one of the last uh, releases from him. Unfortunately, Daniel Johnston passed away a couple years ago. But here he was in 2017, live in concert, uh, backed up by the band Wilco. Uh, or at least Jeff Tweedy of Wilco. So here's some of his iconic imagery here. I'll zoom in a little bit. But if you see here, the guy on the guitar, and out of his head, so this is, I guess, symbolic of Daniel Johnston in his younger days. And then out of his head is coming the famous, 
Hi, how are you? A frog is what he called it. So that might look a little bit familiar. Anyway, so I did have that. But also, uh, so there's, uh, again, Someone Still Loves You, Boris Yeltsin's uh, Tape Club album. Great album. Very intimate. Beautifully done. Uh, one of my favorite bands. Um, but I also thought of a couple others. Um, now, Elliot Smith. So I have his int an introduction. It's the closest we've gotten to a greatest hits from him. Uh, some of the stuff on it, not all of it, is lo-fi, do-it-yourself type music. R the, the recording qualities are rough, you know, a little more raw sounding. Uh, not all of them, again, but some of them on this. So some of his work was like that. And then a, probably a bigger influence than Elliot Smith on me is Bob Dylan. And my favorite Bob Dylan release, still to date, are, and uh, a few years ago, several years ago now, they've f finally officially released the actual bootleg, uh, uh, basement tape bootlegs. So they're no longer bootlegs, but this is uh, a Record Store Day version of it. Uh, not all of them, but some of them made to look like the original bootlegs that floated around, but on vinyl instead of eight, uh, was eight millimeter, eight millimeter tape or whatever. But uh, anyway, the basement tape. So the official bootleg series release is called, uh, I have both the, uh, the basement tapes raw, which I recommend. And I also have on CD, the basement tapes complete. Um, I found it used and got a good deal on it. So I have, you know, a copy of all of the basement tape recordings. You can find, they, they made a playlist on, uh, I know Spotify and I'm sure other uh, streaming services. It's not, it's a different, it's the same recordings, but they selected certain tracks off of it for uh, streaming services. But the basement tapes, they are the reason that the band did, and Bob Dylan didn't really originally release it, the basement tapes in the late, mid, late 60s or even 70s was because they were too embarrassed by the low quality recordings because they were just recording demos of songs and having a great time in, in a Big Pink's uh, basement in Woodstock or near to Woodstock. And, uh, but they were floating around and, he, and people were getting their hands on them anyway. So they went in and the original release, uh, official release was just called The Basement Tapes and has the famous artwork. I think I do have a copy of it in there. I have a mixture of people that look like they could be in a carnival or circus. Uh, but they actually went back into a studio on a lot of it and touched it up to make it seem uh, more professional sounding. And I do have a copy of that. It's neat, but not the same as the actual basement tapes that they released several years ago as the part of the bootleg series. Uh, I highly recommend those. But anyways, all those are inspirations, and they gave me the, the bravery to release our current catalog, as is... Um, despite all of its flaws because my hope is in time we will continue to be able to give you better quality stuff studio grade quality stuff better written songs better music musicianship at least on my part i am the least i feel like personally i'm the least talented musician in the band uh or the trio we currently have that's my opinion um but uh, we'll keep getting better, and we want to get better, and we want to make our music more accessible to more people. But I'm well aware that people out there will hear what we currently have as of November 8, 2021, and think it's bad. And all I have to say is it's, that it's not for you if you think it's bad. It's for those who can look beyond the limitations. Anyways, thank you for listening. Um, please subscribe. If you like this, please give it a like. And please go to our Bandcamp, support us and buy our music. Thank you very much.